the it's now the uh, package that was working previously until I updated our uh, JML utils that's now uh, not loading. But talking with John, it seemed like it didn't really, I might not. Bill, Bill, do you, do you want to take over the screen by any chance? Do you want to like take over the screen so that we could look at your computer? And, and Nate, while he's doing that, do you want to just ex tell Bill a little bit your experience with Mac and how Mac might differ from PC with our Sienna? That would be really helpful. Well, I, I, it, I have not, I don't have a ton of experience doing it with Macs because I used to use a Mac, but it, it, it kind of worked pretty well for me. Um, the only thing that I would expect might be problematic is that, is that Mac will maybe expect to compile some, some of the packages from source. Yeah. And there could be an issue there. Is that what's going on? I, I think so. Um, I could. Uh, That's exactly what we're trying to do. Yes. Yeah. Because so, it, I can't. I can't give him a binary from Windows. Right. And so what he's got to be. Package? He's got to be able to build it himself. What's the package that is in question? Is it RCNA? It's JML. Uh, no, it's just JML utils, which is actually not even that important. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, it's, it's some of my utilities, you know, that that we use occasionally in some of the scripts. Yeah. But why would that require, why would that be any different across platforms? Because that's all written in R, isn't it? Correct. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, no, I don't know either. So I could, I could show you, like I was able to install all the other RCNA packages, no problem. Do you, uh, want, to, Phil, do you want to pull it up? Is it possible that there's different versions of R also that might be part of the problem? Um, yeah, I could, I could. I could share my screen here. That'd be great. Um, the the thing that really weirded me out was that you were able to build RHNet tools, but yeah. not not JML utils. I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all. Yeah. So I have RHNet tools now, no problem, and RCNA, RCNA <laughs> test. Yeah. So the last thing out of uh, John's suite of packages here, um, I'll go to. And the least important, I might add, which is a good thing, yeah. I guess, but so, still. So I'm going to try and build this here. So these were the steps that I did to try and clone uh, JML utils. So I'm on GitHub. I'm copying uh, that URL. And then I'm going into, um, oh, file, new project, and inversion control, clone from a Git repository. And I'm doing copy and paste that JML utils. So this is the steps that I did for RHNet tools. Right, so um, now you have a project called JML utils on your, on your computer, right? In theory, <laughs> if, it, if, it, if it works. So I'm going to go create project. Okay, and All right, so. Okay, so you, ha you have created the project because there it is up in your upper right-hand right corner. And now I want to build it as Correct. a package. So this is where, where it gives me the error. And so um, I've also tried to do this using uh, the dev tools library in R and just using the simple install underscore GitHub function because. Yeah. Because that's what I do normally when I'm installing packages from GitHub. Like, uh, all right, that that was going to be my next question. Why why aren't you doing it that way? <laughs> yeah, no, uh, we tried it that way first. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like, even for um, I have this uh, great package for slides for teaching with R uh, based off of R markdowns called uh, Sharingan, and I download it fine from install GitHub. Um, so. Yeah, I'm going to click on install and restart. And last so time, far, but then it blows up. Yeah. Well, that's all fine. So far, so good. <clears throat> but then, yeah. Let's see. 
Oh, guess what? You just, you, you just okay. built a damn package. <laughs> you just needed me to be on the phone, I think. That I was it. <laughs> it knew it was being watched. And, and I just it's like updated, wave function collapse. Yeah, and I just updated R uh, the other day, too. So I'm up at version 4.0.2. Um, yeah, that's okay. that probably was the difference. <laughs> Just well, the the package I was using before was four point zero point one from, or was it four point zero point zero? It was one that one the two, but still, yeah. that ought those to are, have been okay. But I don't those know. are early versions of a major upgrade, and sometimes those just are a little bit buggy. Yeah, yeah. maybe that okay. Would be great. So anyhow, yeah, let's let's uh, let's give a cheer one way I'm, or another. Yeah, I'm caught up to caught up with all the packages. So. Oh, that's great. Let me just say you're welcome. <laughs> 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 See, you know, that, that's the consulting business I want to have. You know, <laughs> where you just you know, thank you very much. That will be a hundred dollars, please. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Round up to the nearest hour. Yeah. That's right. Awesome. Uh, dear. Um, but we do have a lot of other stuff we could share with you, Nate, about uh, our analyses, um, some of which are have been um, going really well. And then there's a few others that have, you know, we have a few uh, questions about and um, uh, some stuff that would be good to discuss, basically. Yeah. So Lenny sent me some stuff, particularly the modeling of the ordered network right and then uh, also last week sent a, a lot of uh like a series i think it was a series of, of models in a mo representing a model building process i believe right basically we were trying to see whether there were substantially different effects from um close friend or you know friend only and the yeah. only way to do that, of course, is, you know, you create these nested networks and you run them in the same model. And we did, we have found some interesting differences. The two major ones are, um, well, in the first place, the out degree is quite different for the two, but that's not surprising because the uh, uh, close friend network is much sparser than the friend mm -hmm. network. Um, but it still may be a good thing to kind of have controlled in your model. Um, Secondly, and this is perhaps the most important thing, we found out that it's the close, the, the friend network, but not the close friend network, that seems to give rise to the average alter effect for a uh, recovery factor. Because um, we, we had found that, as a, which is really in some ways our most important finding, that recovery is, is improved by having affiliations with people whose recovery factor is, is higher than your own. Um, and average so, alter. So the, so the model that Lenny sent has the, because I noticed that, I noticed this when I was looking at it, that the average alter effect was not statistically significant, but it was for the, it was with respect to the friend network, not the close friend network. So maybe the other way around. Fnet, is that the? That's the friend network and CF close friend is the uh, close friend network. Yeah, this this one says Fnet. So so, what you just said was different. You said that it was the close ties with the close friends that yeah. were facilitating influence. So how do you know? No, that? no, other way around. It's the friend network that facilitates the influence, not the close friend. Oh, okay, gotcha. <laughs> and the the effect is not quite statistically significant in all models, but it's pretty close. Um, and it's always. Um, it's always uh, at least one tail significant uh, in the expected direction. So you did try this with only the CF net average alter effect? Uh, no, it was always uh, the only time that we ever used, uh, looked at this with CF was when we also had F net in the same model, which is the whole point. We wanted to see whether, you know, the average alter effect was uh, coming from close friends or um, from people who were just merely friends. So when you had them both in, obviously probably neither one of them was significant, but it no, seemed like the, the Fnet one was stronger. Yeah, and, and it was, I can't remember, it was quite 0.052 tail, but it was very close. Whereas CF wasn't even in the ballpark. 
You know, it, it's, so, it's so so John, I may I might not have shared this with you. Yeah, but I did run it for close net, um, just just close net, um, just with that in there, mm -hmm. um, and basically, um, just to kind of the health degree was significant, reciprocity was significant, transitive was significant, three cycles was significant. Want to show the run? Um, unfortunately, I can't show it because I'm recording this. Um, and if I pull it up, it'll stop the recording, unfortunately. But, but I'm reading it from another computer. Um, <clears throat> and um, so the average alter, which is under the um, RF behavior dynamics, was right. basically 0 0.11, um, which was the estimate and standard error was 0 0.22. Yeah, so your T value is about 0.5 ish. Gotcha. Um, yeah, that, that's, that's surprising. There you go. But the interesting thing about that, um, you know, my thought there was that that was an important finding, possibly because it suggests that people who are relatively new to the house are more likely to have fewer close friends. And so maybe it's the people that they're friendly with, as opposed to really having close friends with, and you know, uh, whatever their recovery factor is that counts in terms of affecting their own recovery, because that's all they've got. I mean, being new, newer to the house, they're more likely to improve their recovery factor. They're, they have more room to improve, if you will. Um, right. So that was kind of my thought that that this was in some way suggesting that since most of the action, if you will, in recovery factor change is with new uh, residents, and since most new residents will have fewer close friends, that probably is part of the reason why um, friends rather than close friends are what's, are impor what's important for improvement. So you just said something that, <clears throat> that generated an, a thought. Sure. Um, my guess is that the longer you're in the house, the less likely your recovery factor is to change. Correct. That's, that's, we know that already from some analyses that Mike Stuhlmiller did. So maybe that could be incorporated as an effect on the rate in the behavior function. Interesting idea. So it would be a, a function of amount of time in residence on the rate. Yeah, and that could focus, that could then focus the influence effect basically on individuals who are newer to the house and might eliminate some noise. That's an interesting thought, yeah. Yeah, that's a really good idea because basically what you're doing is you're weighting the amount of change in the recovery factor. Yes. And that's very plausible. Oh, wow, okay, great idea, Nate. Wow. I, I, I just, that would not have occurred to me. Brilliant. That also reminds me that, I don't know, maybe you already clarified this, but I was watching your videos and the ones that you guys recorded. Yeah. When you were talking about the rate functions and what they mean. Yeah. And, and what I know about the rate functions is that <clears throat> the estimate refers to the number of and it's probably on a log scale, but it's effectively the number of changes that any one individual actor considers ah. making during a period. Okay, so it's not the total, not the total number. It's it's the um, uh, the number per per uh, per subject. Per subject that they that they uh, have the opportunity to change. Yeah, but they Thanks. don't necessarily change. Okay, thank you. That that's that's a great clarification. I, I if I ever knew that, I forgot it. So. so can can you explain that again? And I'm there's like five periods. Are you talking about yeah. five effects for each, one for each period or basically each each uh, uh, period is considered to be a um, a sort of a separate longitudinal observation, but the results are pooled to get one set of explanatory parameters. Um, is kind of how it works. Mike, are you asking about the rate parameters specifically? Yeah, 
I was just trying to understand what you were suggesting and where that would go in the model. Now that I'm getting used to looking at these models and the where the, uh, yeah. where the time in the house interaction would go in the model or, or more generally what the rate back functions are. No, where, where the time in the house would go. So you were saying that after people are in the house for a long time, the recovery factor stops changing. Yeah. So where would you put, so it sounds like time in house should have an impact on the recovery factor rate that represents the amount of change at each period. Or there's, so there's like a, a rate function looks like something like an intercept and then there's a linear shape and a quadratic shape. Okay, so I would refer to the linear shape as, as very much like an intercept. The rate function is, is really a separate, it's, I mean, you can almost think of it like a separate mo model. It's a model of how frequently individuals are considering changes to their behavior. Right. Uh, and and you would add a covariate effect on that rate uh, the same way you would add any other effect but it's it's among the it's a one of the type is in instead of evaluation or creation or uh, endowment it's called rate and it and it would there would be one per period I believe and you would just include or maybe not I'm I can't remember how they organize them but you would just include an effect on the rate based on that in res exogenous variable. And my sense is that uh, that would be a negative estimate lowering the rate. For those who had been in the house for a long time. Within each period, so it, yeah. Could you guys hear what I was saying just then? Yeah, you just dropped out the last half a sentence, but I knew what you were going to say. And somebody, somebody, somebody called, and apparently that turns off my sound. I would just expect that uh, you know the it would be a negative effect of in res on rate. Yeah, yeah. The um, the model. I mean, if you if you you know read about how the model is specified, it literally is a multiplicative model in the sense that you have a, a rate function which indicates when somebody, stochastically, when a person gets an opportunity to make a change, okay? Because um, remember, this is all simulation-based, right? I mean, you've got a stochastic model here, um, mm -hmm. which is being simulated, and it's the simulations that produce the estimations. Because you simulate the model, um, and you look at what the, um, you know, how far the, uh, uh, statistics that are generated by that simulation differ from the data, basically, from the database statistics. And then you make an adjustment to the parameters based on that, and you keep going like that. And that's how the model gets estimated. Um, so it's, it's really not like, you know, any kind of normal model that, that we're used to thinking about, like a two-level model or a three-level model or something like that. It's, it's truly a stochastic process, which is the simulation of which is used to tune it, if you will. But um, yeah, the, the so it, if if you look at what happens um, during the simulation, it is a function, a multiplicative function of one, the probability that somebody in the sample gets to change, multiplied by the probability of what that change is. That's what it is. It's got those two parts to it. Okay, and that's literally what the formula looks like. Yeah, so, same for network and behavior. Correct. So what the rate function ultimately ends up doing is like if you if you interact something and that's what, what you would do would be a multiplicative interaction with the uh, uh, with the rate for to keep people with a particular characteristic, right? And what that would have the effect of doing is to overweight or underweight the resulting run as a function of how much change happens. So the more change that that happens um, for a particular class of individuals the more effect they're going to have on the ultimate, um, uh, well, it, it will, put it this way, it will, yeah, it will, it will reweight what happens in the um, uh, objective function part of the estimation, if you will. I'm not, probably not saying this very well. Um, 
but people who, who make more changes are going to have more to do with what the parameters look like than people who have less changes. Yeah. Right, Nate? Yeah. And, and if it's it got to be true. And if it turns out that um, we're right about this hypothesis and we've built the model in such a way to not change the rate depending on in time uh, in res L, <clears throat> then the model is going to be trying to allow all those older folks to make changes, but they're never making changes. So it's just sort of adding noise to the, yeah. to the estimate. Exactly. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, my hope it's, is that it will clean it. It will, uh, you know, clean it up. <laughs> yeah. Do a better job of modeling the data. It's a better way. Yeah. Does, does that make sense, Mike? You look uh, puzzled still. No, maybe just thinking. Yeah, no, it sounds like a good idea. And I could imagine if you segmented or divided the sample up, like in the short timers, the medium timers, and the long mm -hmm. timers, the parameters would probably look, those rate parameters for the recovery factor would definitely look different. Yeah. Because the long timers, they're not doing much systematic. They kind of, they bounced around a little bit, but they pretty much flatlining. But those new timers are the ones that are like either they either make it and they go way up or they they crash and they go way down. Yeah. I think that's a, such a great idea, Nate. It's, that's really going to improve this model. I bet you a nickel. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Okay. No, I won't. You're, you're I in your hundred bucks, man. <laughs> <laughs> so whatever. So, Ken, I'm just wondering, I know you were running the model with loan where we added a couple dimensions. Has your model run? No, I was having a bunch of trouble, so I had to restart R from the oh. beginning, and now I just got it to run. Okay, okay. My, kept giving me an error of connection. Okay, no, no problem. Um, I, I just thought, you know, we'll we'll be able to look at that. Um, by the way, is 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 Mike? Did you have another question about the um, numbers? Um, I don't know if you wanted to raise that with John. Um, that, that might be a more technical question that John can react to. Yeah, Mike, I, I got your uh, note and I read it and you're absolutely right. Um, I'm not sure the, I think, the, I, I thought that the um, um, RCN a setup branch or the repo had that code in it. Um, but regardless, um, I'm just, I was just in the middle of writing you an email where I was sending you the code. Um, it's a little bit, what I probably should have done. No, let me back up a step. When I looked at, at the people in make network set and compared them to um, the people that, and, you know, doing the usual things of like removing people who, um, um, didn't make any nominations, but nominated by others, stuff like that. That was what you were referring to when you were talking about, um, uh, you know, people who were only ever alters, but never egos, stuff like that. Um, there was a small discrepancy of like five people or something like that between the two. And rather than try to figure out exactly why, I just simply took the intersection of those two sets of SIDs as the ones that should be included in the uh, in the analysis. And I think what that basically did was it just it removed a couple of people, uh, mainly it removed those 34 who didn't participate in wave seven. And then the other five were, you know, either people who, uh, um, oh gosh, I don't know. Um, let me see what I said here. Uh, sorry, give me a second. I'm kind yeah, of here. I, I did some simplified, we just grabbed some simple networks, statistics, and used them in the survival model. Okay. And there were some people, some odd cases that we talked about, and we tried to figure out, these people didn't nominate anybody, but they got nominated, and how could have that happened? Yeah. And we decided to exclude them for various reasons, right? Yeah. Myra checked on a few to see if they really were in the house. Right, right. Not so basically, house. it was about stuff like that, which I didn't feel like I had to go into because I felt as though you and Myra had done a very thorough job of deciding who should and who should not be in those 
well, just limiting ourselves to the first six waves for the data quality reasons that we had. So anyway, net of all of that, it came out to the, um, the 627 that we finally ended up with. And I'm, I'm gonna send you the code so you can see what I did uh, to rectify all of that. Okay. Um, but it's, it's, it's not really an actual um, uh, rectification. It's really just more of a saying, okay, you know, I accept that the SIDs that, that you know, Mike and Myra have approved here are okay, but, but no others. And so I made sure that none of the other ones were in the analysis set that I had put together. That was it. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Yeah, I thought, I thought it was fine. I mean, there was no point really in my duplicating, trying to duplicate all the work that you guys had done, even if I could have. <laughs> so, right. I, I, I mean, what, what it's going to come back and, and we're going to have to deal with that when we actually write it up and, you know. Yeah, because it's know. a discrepancy, but it's, it's understandable that if yeah. you got some people that just fell through the cracks, I mean, it's and and not even a handful, more like a teaspoonful. Right. Oh, so it's in you know in the big picture, it's totally no big deal. So just getting back to the Mac issue, Phil, do you have any other kind of questions you might have about Mac and and kind of what you're trying to get yourself going with? You're on. Sorry, I'm on mute. No, I'm 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 good now, Lenny. I think I can now finally start playing around with uh, some of the code, uh, the modeling code, and stuff like that. Just get my hands a bit more dirty with the process that you know Ted and John have been outlining the last few meetings. So um, I could eventually get caught up to speed where everyone else is at uh, currently. Great. Okay. It turns out Gabby. Um, she's the other person who's a Mac user, um, but she got delayed. She's got something else that she had to do. Um, so I, I'd hope that we'd be able to do some problem solving with her. But, um, but here we go. Just as I yeah. mentioned, Gabby, Gabby uh, is on the line. So, uh, sorry Gabby, about that. so do you want to, this is Nate Dugan. You, you've probably met him in, in the past, uh, uh, maybe. If, if not, but he has ex some experience with, with um, the Max and, and, as, and Phil does too. Phil has just gotten some problem solving. So do you, do you want to kind of tell us what your, the problem you've, you've run into and maybe we can, um, and, and, and Mike, if, if you want to uh, vacate now, we're gonna just be talking about Mac and I know you're, you're less interested in that. So that's okay. Well, well, actually though, uh, later on, I think we are gonna talk about some model specifications and stuff. Okay, so why don't we just kind of focus on that now and then we'll go to Gabby after that. How's that sound? Yeah. Okay, yeah, I have is a, that okay with you, Gabby? Yeah, that's good. All right. Yeah, so, so, so John, do you want to? Uh... Sure. Um, let me, bit, what I need to do is to find, uh, where did I put that stuff? So I had, I had one more thought about the model that Lenny had showed, the uh, um, ordered network model, if you're interested in that right now. Sure. Definitely. Yeah. What I noticed between the two networks was that, and maybe you already noticed this, but the reciprocity was a lot stronger in the... Yeah close oh, friend network which which is not surprising it means to me that it that that having the same kind of close friendship nomination from the other person is pretty important for you to give that to them in other words it's almost like there has to be an agreement about a strong close Nate, friendship tie Nate as you're talking could you just right. put it up on the screen so everyone could see it I don't think so. I, I can hear. Okay. okay. I'm on my I'm on my phone and I don't have the results okay. on there. Got it. All right. So um, that's this is the a model, and you can see here that the um, uh, reciprocity for a close friend right here is 1.45. Uh, 
it's still significant here for um, a friend up here where I'm waving the cursor, but it's uh, much smaller. I mean, it's like, you know, maybe only 20% um, the size or something. No, no, not that much. It's, it's about 60% the size. Um, but to me, that, that already tells some kind of story about, you know, the importance of, of um, develop, I guess, the development of strong relationships in the houses. Uh, but I thought that there might yes. be another way to sort of expand on that story by including a cross network effect between those two networks. Yeah. And, and it would be something like, I mean, the first thing I would try would be whether or not a reciprocal tie or a reciprocal connection between a dyad in the friendship network increase the chances of either a tie or a reciprocal right. tie in the close friend network. Right. We already tried just, you know, um, if they were, if somebody nominated somebody in the um, friend network, did that lead to a close friend friendship tie? And it, it, there's no discernible effect there probably because it's not a, um, a very, uh, how can I say it? It's not a very discriminating effect. I mean, because almost everybody regards everybody else as a friend, quote unquote, in most houses. And there just aren't a lot of cases where they don't get along. Um, and I think that's probably why it didn't work out. But the reciprocated thing is really worth looking at. I agree. Okay. And the, the first one that you, you just suggested that you already tried, right. strikes me, it strikes me as strange that that model even fit because... because oh, uh, it didn't. <laughs> okay. Well, and the reason I think would be because uh, the any effect in the close friend network is conditional on a tie being present in the first place in the in the friendship network. You're right, you know. And there was a part of me as I was specifying this, I was kind of thinking to myself, you know, this doesn't quite make sense, but I don't, I can't quite put my finger on why. <laughs> But yes, you're right. It's kind of like, you know, um, it's true by definition. Right. Yeah. What it boils down to. Yeah. Okay. So that was actually dumb. Um, but okay. You know, we, we can move on from dumb. A slightly Not, less dumb. Nobody here is dumb. <laughs> well, I, I work on it at times, but, you know, thank you for that. Anyhow, um, okay, uh, but you know this model is kind of worth looking at anyway. Um, this is uh, uh, a, uh, a start at a model that um, I really want to try to develop here. Um, and this was run by Ted, I believe, uh, and maybe Lenny, Lenny too. What we see here is a the beginnings of a um, four dependent variable run where we've got the endogenous variables are F net friendship, CF net close friendship, loan network. This is the, you know, um, how much money do you, you know, would you trust somebody else to loan? So a, an out tie basically is one of trusting, you know, I trust Jay to loan them. I think it was like a hundred dollars or more. Um, and then of course, finally, we have the recovery factor as our behavior variable, right? And so we want to try to build up, build this up. But here's what we're trying to do, Nate. We're trying to, to understand, because, because we have evidence from a lot of Mike's um, uh, really excellent work over the last six months or so, that um, the um, being um, part of the loan network has a very strong effect on your um, probability of leaving the house and also your probability of relapse. So it seems like a really key um, aspect of social integration in the houses. Can you say, so can you say a little more detail about that? What, what do you mean being part of it? How is that measured? Well, I, I think, Mike, can you, can you refresh our memory about that maybe? Um, I, I know it's like out of sight, out of mind, but um, I remember that you know your integration in the loan network measured somehow or another 
<clears throat> was an important predictor of um, relapse and of house departure. And I, it could have actually been a house level factor like um, the density of that network, which would have been, you know, rather than an individual level thing, it would have been, let's say, house level. Um, I'm just not remembering the detail there offhand. Do you, by any chance? <laughs> um, I, I'm sorry to put you on the spot. I mean, I, I, if I had my wits about me, I yeah. wouldn't have to ask. Well, I, I think I may have started out trying to make a resident level score just based on how many times you got nominated for as being someone you would loan someone who the number of times that you got a nomination for being someone worthy of loaning money to. But I, I, can't, I can't remember if I... Mike, let me read it out because I got the paper in front of me, okay? <laughs> okay. So, so basically, we made correlations between the house network character characteristics, identified some promising social network contracts, constructs such as density. Um, so we found that density of willingness to loan money network within a house was positively associated with house, house level earned wages, social support and self-esteem, and negatively associated with stress. Conversely, the density of house advice-seeking relationships was positively related to house-level stress. So houses in which residents are willing to share resources with other members who may be in need showed higher rates of well-being at the house level. Advice-seeking in itself may signal stress, as stress may motivate residents to seek advice from more peers. So that was that finding. And then we actually have another finding too. Um, but uh, it, was, it was the, it was, it was the, uh, um, there, there was that, which is good, good to know. And there was also the, um, at least the paper where we looked at relapse um, in a survival so, model. So in a sense, we had um, willingness to loan money was possibly associated with poor individual level social capital variables suggesting availability of instrumental resources may be important to ongoing recovery. To test whether the house level social network factors then support recovery, a survival analysis was conducted, finding associations between relapse risk and network densities over a 28-month span. In particular, more dense advice-seeking networks were associated with higher rates of relapse suggesting that advice seeking might represent a sign of organizational health problems. In contrast, higher loaning networks were associated with less relapse, so willingness to lend money could be measuring a willingness to help others in need. Right, so that, that was basically what I was basing my statement on. Um, and so what that, what that now, the question that poses to us is um, okay. What does it take for somebody to get into the loan network, right? Because we presume that it's that affiliation which um, is associated with this. Uh, I, I mean, there's there's other possibilities too. That it's not just about being part of it, but it's it's a there's there's a more general, uh, uh, essentially group level characteristic that we're groping around for here of, you know, as in the text that Lenny was reading there, um, of being willing to help other people. And the loan network is just an indicator of that, essentially. Um, so maybe it's a question of you have to be in that house. You don't even necessarily have to be part of the loan network per se to benefit from that membership. But there's something about that loan network that's important. And so we're groping around trying to figure out um, what uh, other aspects of individuals or how structure, what have you, um, promote a denser loan network. It's kind of what it boils down to. So that's really where this model is trying to go. Um, so far, so good. 
For me, it is. Okay. Obviously, this is a pretty bare bones version of that as yet, because all the networks are shown here as being uh, non-interdependent. I mean, except for the, of course, uh, definitional dependency of F and CF, right? Um, and we have just basically uh, a few uh, endogenous uh, plus covariate related effects in each one. And for the lone network, in fact, we only have the default parameters of reciprocity and out degree. So we're trying to build this model up. But right now, this looks like a pretty good model. Look, it converges pretty well here. You can see that up here. Um, most of the parameters are statistically significant. Um, you know, uh, one interesting thing here is that um, the, uh, you guys remember that the FNet out degree parameter was not statistically significant in previous runs? Well, now it is, but it's positive. And a positive, um, so, so, so in other words, a net of close friends, we find that the friendship network is actually a, um, well, there's two ways you can look at this. One is that it's a non-sparse network, right? It's a, it's a relatively dense network. John, John you said close friends. Um, the, well, the friendship network is, um, yeah, that's what I'm talking about here. This is like friends only, but not close friends. That is a network that's pretty easy to get into. And in fact, actually, the higher the um, uh, out degree that an individual has, the more likely they are actually to add yet another individual, net of all things, to their, to their network. So just a clarification, my understanding was that the F net, that F net was friend or close friend. Yes. It is, however, remember that because we have both of these effects in the model, the effects you're looking at here would be effects only of friendship controlling for close friendship. Right? I don't think that's correct. I think it, <clears throat> I think that's a model of, I think you can just think of that as a model of being at least a friend. And then, a friend. and then the other model is, is okay. I know. Actually, actually, I agree with you. I, and, and maybe that's what I was trying to say. Okay. Um, however, if you did not have the close friend network in here, the effects that you would see on the friendship network would include close friend. I'm struggling to think that they would actually be much different. Well, they may not be, just depending on the number of close friendships that there are. Um, but the, uh, <clears throat> oh, I see what you're saying. Um, why do you say that? Well, because those two models are effectively, uh, we'll, we'll say that this way. Um, the FNet model is not dependent in any way on the CFNet model. The reverse is true because the CFNet model is a model of uh, those ties that are present in the FNet model, only those ties that are present in the FNet model. So it, the CFNet model doesn't even consider tie changes for those ties that are not present in the FNet model. <clears throat> On the other hand, the FNet model doesn't isn't constrained in any way like that. And it doesn't depend on ties that are present in the CFNet model because you don't have any effects in there that say, you know, um, something about the CFNet network should affect the FNet network. Like, a, I don't know. I I'm think you're right. No, I think you're right. I think you're right. Um, on the other hand, um, what we can see from this model, though, is what differentiates the close friend net network from the friendship network. Okay, yeah. so I, I will um, agree with you that my early state earlier statement was probably incorrect. You know, um, nevertheless, it is interesting that this model here, which includes the lone network, 
um, and also the close friend network shows a statistically significant out degree effect for friendship network, which it did not have before. I mean, the T value in previous models here is about one. Um, so at the very least, the model seems to be a better specification of the data um, in the sense that this parameter has been estimated more precisely. As a matter of fact, it's about twice as big as it was in the previous runs. It, but it, formerly, it was around 0.22 or something like that with a standard error in around the same ballpark. But um, now it's quite a lot bigger. Um, so there's obviously some kind of, you know, indirect dependency going on here. Yeah, and John, I got a kind of a cryptic message when I built this model and ran it from our Siena. Okay. It said the one, it said the friend network was above the close friend network. Yeah. That would be honored in the estimation unless right. I didn't want it to be. And then I had to go change, flip a switch in some some control switch somewhere if I didn't want right. that. I, I didn't know what that meant, but. Well, what that means is that the close friend network is a proper subset of the friend network, which is true, right? I mean, you can't be a friend without being a friend or close friend, right? That's the way they are defined. Uh -huh. All right, excuse me, you can't, you can't be a close friend unless you are also a friend or close friend. That's the way yeah. I want to say it. So it's just saying that, uh, and that's, that's exactly what we do want, yes. Yeah, so where I pointed out that the close friend network model is conditional on the FNet model having a tie. But not so the converse. Only modeling those ties that are present in the FNet model. Right, but the, the simulation would still have to get you into being a friend or close friend before it would get you into being a close friend is kind of the idea. Right, and it's just the software is just telling you that uh, it recognized that in your data, and so it's setting that constraint. And so literally what that means is that in a simulation, somebody, a, a relationship cannot jump from not a friend at all, the way we define it, to close friend. It would have to jump to friend first and then close friend. So that's kind of the practical significance of that constraint. And, and that's okay. You know, that's exactly the kind of thing that we want. I mean, does that, does it ever happen that somebody goes straight from, you know, I don't know this person, a close friend? Well, maybe, but it's not unreasonable to assume that there's at least a short period there where they're, because um, remember this, that the simulation is supposed to be taking place in continuous time, right? This is not like a model of waves. It's taking place in continuous time. So it's reasonable to suppose that that transition is a two-step process. And in the uh, manual, when you read, when they keep talking about mini steps, yeah, that's their kind of heuristic way of talking about short, instantaneous chunks of time. Correct. I mean, if you think about a um, um, a continuous time markup process, okay, where normally the um, wait times between um, changes is uh, negative exponential, right? With, a, with lambda as being the average, you know, which is the average of the distribution. Um, that's, what, that's basically what you're talking about. And in fact, that's actually the way that the, um, that's the basic specification of the, um, uh, the rate function. So, you know, there's a random process for deciding who gets to make a mini step, but the time, the wait time between those steps in, you know, quote, real time, which is really in simulation time, but it's a continuous space is given by that, you know, e to the minus lambda, whatever. e to the minus lambda t, I guess it is. You know, which is familiar from just a plain old um, random um, continuous time markup process. Yeah, or continuous time hazard models with constant hazards. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, um, Okay, does that help a little? There, if you want to, you can get a very encyclopedic description of the um, simulation process. Uh, I think from the Snyder's um, Van de Bunden Steglick 2010 um, social networks paper, if, if you want to review and see what that looks like. Um, you know, they, they tell you 
in, you know, excruciating detail how it works. True. <laughs> so, all right. Well, anyway, this, this is what we're trying to do here, Nate. And um, so I have one great suggestion from you, and that is to look at the reciprocal tie in the friendship network as potentiating a tie in, in the close friend network. Um, one of the other questions that we also want to try to understand other possible transitions from the one to the other. But what if it turns out that um, the friendship network is really the important thing here? Um, and that, you know, so what we want to do is we want to see whether being friends potentiates your um, uh, being part of the loan network, mm -hmm. that might actually be the most substantively interesting question we could ask, or one of the most, of this model. Um, any thoughts about how we would want to try to specify that dependency? Yeah, so it's almost like... <clears throat> It's almost like, well, I haven't thought through it all, but it's almost like any of the basic effects for how one network can depend on another. Yeah. You could it's tell possible. For, for how that could happen. Exactly. It's, it's right. plausible. So, it's, so I hate to say like go data dredging, but, but like that's one option. Another is to, you know, is to spell all these effects out and what they, what they, imply about real life in the houses and yeah. and look for the one that just is the most plausible or I, order them by plausibility and start there and that's yeah. just a little more you know hypothesis testing oriented hey Nate, can i for everybody just make sure we understand what this these dichotomies are because there's nuances in these words so let's just kind of think about either you're a close friend, you're a friend, those are the two we've been talking about, okay? But what's on the other side? The other side is three choices. And I just want to make sure everyone knows those three choices. Mm -hmm. You're not a friend or a close friend if you're an acquaintance, a stranger, or an adversary. So, so acquaintance just, is the closest thing to a friend that exactly. is not a friend. Yeah, so just kind of think about that, because that might have some bearings on our discussions. Adversary is a really interesting one to me, and, and it's almost like you could make a network out of that in and of itself. That could be super interesting to explore. <laughs> Good point. Uh, and, and in particular, explore how it affects other networks <clears throat> you know you know actually what occurs to me is that in a house where there are relatively a lot of adversaries i mean i i might actually take that that uh information and try to make a um uh what would amount it to a house level variable out of it uh-huh um, you know uh and you know indicate what i don't know percentage of relationships uh are adversarial and see if I could use that as a predictor. I love that idea. Along with the others. Yeah, polarization. It's the variable of our time. Yeah. Right on. And I mean, because we have so much, we have these like hints and, and, and possibilities of there being these house level effects and we've been able to tease some of those apart, thanks Mike to your um, uh, multi-level modeling work. Um, normally in stochastic actor models, we don't, we can't exactly do multi-level models, but Nate and I have talked about the idea of um, having like house level, including a house level measure, which is gonna be the same for everybody in the house basically, um, along with individual versions of the same thing, which is a kind of a, you know, um, it's, I mean, it's like a fixed effects approach almost to multi-level modeling um, because you're not really partitioning the variance exactly. Um, 
except that in the simulation, well, I don't let me get too far in the, into the weeds here. I'm just going to go um, go ahead with this idea, Nate, and jump in if you're, you know, if I'm getting it wrong. But I think our idea was that you would have um, like a measure of, let's say, adversarialness in a house, and that would go along with the, you know, some kind of a um, similar valence or opposite valence network, um, which is happening at the individual level, right? And that net of those two effects, you would get some idea as to the extent to which friendship and adversarial densities um, or propensities affect people net of each other, <clears throat> excuse me, net of each other. Um, and so that would be a way to get an idea as to whether there was a house level effect of something like that. Is that more or less what, what we kind of talked about, Nate? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, but, it, and, but you didn't really specify that whether that network would be an endogenous or exogenous network. And I think that it would have to be without, you know, making this really hard on us would have to be an exogenous network. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, but, but approximately, yes, that's what I was thinking. But also, I'm not sure if, if you're really just interested in the house level effect, I'm not sure that you need to include the individual or dyadic variable itself. You can just, in, you can just calculate a mean yeah. for the house and include that as an ego well, whatever kind of effect you want, but probably an ego effect. But, but, but I guess the idea was that it would be interesting to know whether the effect applies to individuals in houses with this characteristic generally, or whether it also applies to, um, you know, to, to individuals net of whatever is going on in their house. Yeah. And yeah. as with most two level phenomenon, phenomena, they could be quite different. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. So I was just speaking about, uh, well, I guess I was taking your uh, question about uh, identifying a house level effect. And yeah, right. that, and so that's what you do. But yeah, if you want to separate house level and individual or tie level effect. Exactly. You would do that. One way or another, yeah. Um, Listen, uh, one thing we could take, do is take a quick look at the cross-level effects in the, in the manual and right now and think a little bit about how those might apply to this um, friendship versus loan, for example, situation. I take a swing at that. Sure. Yeah. That, that sounds right. And I'll reshare here. I've got the manual open. And, and by the way, just for adversary, we, we might want to just find out how many actually there are, because if there's so few, it might not even be possible. But yeah, good point. Absolutely good point. Yeah, it would be something where you'd have to have, and remember it only varies at the house level, so you'd have to have a, at least, I don't know, 10, 15 houses where there was some variation in, in adversarialness, if you will. Um, I, we could look at that, though, and, uh, and um, make a guess as to what might be a good coding. And I'm just making a note about that. So what makes, so what John's about to talk about is it gets really confusing when the networks um, are sort of reversed in direction. Right. So for example, loan, the loan network is, is really answering the question, would I loan, would ego loan alter money? Whereas the friendship network is, does ego consider alter to be a friend? Right, because what we really want to know usually with the loan network is we want to know if somebody is trusted. But the way that the question is asked is one of, do you trust somebody else? Okay. But the thing we're really interested in is what makes somebody trusted? So okay. what what is a good thing? What is a good way to be an alter who gets nominated as somebody that you trust to loan a lot of money? In other words, would be substantively the question that I think is most important. Wouldn't you agree? 
you being anybody. So, so just to emphasize for everyone, it's willingness to loan. And if you're yeah. willing to loan a threshold, $100 to $500, then you make the criterion that you're willing yeah. to loan. If you're willing to loan zero, 10 or $50, then we're basically saying you're not willing to loan. Yeah. So you you don't trust somebody. If you, you have to trust somebody quite a lot, you know, or want to help them a lot. We're not sure which, right? But, um, but either way, uh, we're setting the bar at, at $100 or more. Pretty good slug of money for people in this situation, I would think. All right. Anyway, so here are the cross-network effects that we can consider. This one here is the simplest, the so-called CR fraud effect. And um, if X is our dependent network, so an X would be loaning right, or, you know, whatever, then um, we could ask, um, do you have to be a close friend, for example, in order to be willing to loan somebody money? In that case, the, ma the W matrix would be the matrix of close friendship relationships, okay? And um, so this is basically, and your network statistic here is just um, that there is a close friend tie and does that lead to a loan tie also? The, the, yeah, the you hear wild barking in the background? It, it doesn't bother us, John, it's okay. Okay, well, good, because there's nothing I can do about it. Yeah, no problem. I have influence, but not control. Yeah. Anyway, okay, so that that is a, uh, that's the simplest effect, and that's the one we tried uh, for friend to close friend. It doesn't really make sense because it's already constrained you know, so that you can have a W tie if and only if you have an X tie. So um, that was a stupid idea. But this would not be a stupid thing to look at if you were interested in, for example, whether um, it was necessary to be a close friend with somebody in order that you trust them. But now here's an interesting question. How would you get at the question of being trusted? So yes, we could use this to decide whether um, if I'm a close friend with, um, with J, uh, you know, individual I is, is a close friend with individual J, I'm more likely to tell individual J um, that I'd be willing to loan him or her a hundred bucks or more, okay? But what is it, you know, can, can I, does that also imply that um, uh, like the opposite effect? of being trusted. It's really the same thing, isn't it, Nate? Because... Oh, God. As much as I've looked at this stuff, it's always very confusing. But I know, but, I know. But what you, what you have to do is <clears throat> consider the network that you're thinking of being affected by another network. Right, the loaning network. And pretend like you're the one nominating someone else to be loanable, to be like I'm willing to loan that person something. Right. And that's the effect you want to, you want the effect that operates on that level, so to speak. So the- So it's an alter effect really, isn't it? <laughs> so can you just say again, what you want to model? We would like to know what is it that, that um, what relationships, characteristics or whatever are more likely to uh, make a, an individual um, eligible eligible to be loaned at least a hundred dollars. Uh huh. El okay. Yeah. In other words, trusted. I'll I'll use trusted as a shorthand for that. <clears throat> but that's tricky, remember, because you know since the network talks about exactly defined as somebody that you know ego trust an alter the ego trust um, it's kind of taken from the point of view of ego but what you really want to know is what characteristics of alter or what relationship that you know ego has with alter are the important factors so so if we want to test whether uh <clears throat> Um, say close friend, if just just for specificity, 
You know, how, so how does the close friendship network interact with the loan network? So, so whether um, I nominate someone else, whether Ego nominates Alter as a close friend, right? And how does that affect the likelihood that Ego will be nominated for money for loan willingness? <laughs> it's really hard to say. Whether Ego is eligible for a loan? Yeah. Well, I just say we'll, you know, we'll be trusted. We'll be trusted. Will be trusted. Yeah. Uh, okay, now you got me confused. Yep, it's hard. It's I to J and I to J each time. So aren't you saying if I consider you a friend, I can then I also consider you trustworthy? Yeah, that would be what you were testing if you just specified this. Um, but the thing is that what you really want to know is why do you trust Alter? Because it's Alter's, it's you know, Alter is being trusted, okay? What is it? What was it about Alter that that made you willing to trust him or her? So it's a characteristic not of you, ego necessarily, um, but it could be, I guess. But you're mainly interested in knowing, you know, what was it about Alter that made you think, oh, okay, I can trust this guy. That's really what we're after here. Does that make sense? So, so John, if you have a higher recovery score you're probably more willing to trust them. Exactly, so, so maybe um, if Alter's recovery score, that could be one thing. I would agree that's an important thing to look at. But I don't quite understand why, are, are you saying it's implausible to consider friendship as a, a good basis for trustworthiness? Not or at all. No, not at all. Um, but remember that, you know, if the fact that I nominate you as a friend doesn't mean you aren't nominate me back as a friend, for example. So it doesn't mean we're friends, quote unquote. I mean, I can nominate anybody I want. It doesn't mean that I'm going to get nominated back as somebody that, you know, is trustworthy for a loan or something like that. Um, so the question really becomes one of um, what is it that you know, it, once again, what we're focusing on here is alter, you know, in a kind of a way. And we just have to make sure we rig up the effects in such a way that we're looking at. Um, so, 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 this so being John, something about alter. So, John, if, if the ego is willing to loan something to alter, probably the alter has to basically be willing to at least be a friend. Because if the alter isn't a friend right. of the ego, basically ego is not going to feel comfortable loaning them money. Yeah, but e ego is the one who ego has to tell you if he thinks alters his friend. <laughs> Correct. No, this is all this is all true. But okay, th here's the way to think about it. Then maybe um, <clears throat> am I more likely to trust somebody who nominates me as a close friend? You're more willing to trust someone who nominates you as a close friend or a friend. But if they're not willing to nominate you as a friend or close friend, you're probably less likely to loan them money. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that sounds reasonable, but it seems like, it seems like I gotta, I gotta perceive that friendship somewhere along the line or I, it doesn't do me any good because it'd be like a fan club. Are you willing? Oh, yeah. are yes, you, we have to assume that that loan your fans money just because they love you. No, so maybe maybe the way to say this. I mean, you're you're right, Mike. Uh, and so one way to deal with that might be to say that there has to be a reciprocated friendship or close friendship relationship before I'm willing to trust Alter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that sounds even better. I agree. I'm just trying to get clear in my own mind um, what the specific effects are going to be that we're going to have to include in order to test questions like this. So I'm kind of following, Nate, I'm kind of following your advice on that. Um, now all we have to do is find actual effects or create them if we have to do that, um, that will uh, allow us to put these in the model. Yeah, so I'm almost sure that the one that you just described is available. And it would be something like the effect of 
uh, reciprocity with respect to W on yeah. X. Here's a bunch of degree related effects, which I don't think are relevant. Um, yeah, where nodal degrees in the W network have effects. Yeah, see, that's like, uh, if you're very popular in the friendship network, does that make you more likely to trust people or something like that? So it's, that doesn't really, I think, relate to our questions here directly. Was that, was that number three above where it said mutual ties? Is that, is that what? Uh, yes, yeah. here we go. This is the guy here. Um, so if you have a mutual tie in the friendship network, does that make you more likely to have, um, to trust the other guy in the X network? This would be exactly our guy right here, I think. Agreed. So, so just for everybody, going back to the 2014 paper, basically friendship we see reciprocated, basically close friendship we don't see reciprocated. So that, 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 those findings go back for many years. Say that once more, Lenny. So what we basically have shown in our first paper with five recovery houses, and then our paper that really just looked at the baseline characteristics was that friendships seem to have quite a lot of reciprocity but when we looked at close friendship, um, we basically um, were trust, where we were basically looking at confidant. We called it that, slightly different term in the first paper. We didn't see the confidant basically reciprocated. Yeah, that's different though. Now the confidant had to do with advice, um, I'm quite sure, and not with the, uh, not with the money loaning. Yeah, that, and that's different than what the uh, model is showing. Too. Correct. Anyway, um, yeah, the model shows that close friendships are more reciprocated than friendships, which, which is no big surprise here. Okay, but in any case, no, this is really helpful, Nate. I mean, I think, and, and, and Mike also, um, Th this is really helping to sort of clarify this for me. I think this mutuality thing would be that should be the um, the next substantive thing we look at, but we're going to have to add a few more. We're going to have to build the loan model up a little bit with a few more endogenous parameters, like transitivity and three cycles, just to make sure that we've kind of caught all of those individual dynamics. Go ahead, Nate. And, and I'm I'm not I I'm not suggesting doing this right away, but it could also be that. There's a feedback effect where, uh, you know, the establishment of loan ties feeds back onto strengthening the friendship network. So yeah, maybe, that's a really good idea. Yeah, or maybe the close friend network. And there's nothing wrong with having, you know, one network affect another and then reverse. And vice versa. Show the reverse effect also. Right. It's fascinating, in fact. And, and, and indeed, if you were running simulations, what that would basically lead to, if both parameters are positive, is a, a, an increasing spiral of, you know, more trust and more friendship. Right. Right. I mean, if, assuming these things were continuous. You know, it almost, wow. it almost seems like that we should, because right now monthly wages are part of the recovery factor score. Mm -hmm. But monthly wages seem like they're going to be really, uh, you know, well, it's a hypothetical, right? It's just would you be willing? And you just don't have, you don't have to actually have the money. So I take it back. But yeah, but I see where you're going with that. You, you kind of want to know whether somebody is willing, is not willing because they don't trust the guy or because they just don't have the money. Yeah, yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Is it's, it it's almost seems like it'd be worth splitting wages out from the recovery factor. You know, one thing that we could do uh, that, that would give us an idea about that, uh, Mike, I mean, that's actually something that um, we could do that doesn't involve network modeling we could actually see whether um, people who are, have higher wages are more likely to um, nominate relatively many others as somebody they would loan money to. We could just look into the data and see whether that's the case. Would that be something you'd be willing to look into? Yes, um, say it again though so I can write it down. Just basically, you do before you do that, John, I. 
guys, I have to get going. Um, but it sounds Great. like you got a lot to work with and I'm yeah. happy to meet whenever, whenever you need some different perspectives. So just right. let me know when I can help. Nate, Nate, you have been a huge help. Thank you so much. Thanks, Nate. Yeah. Thanks. All right. Everyone. See you later, man. Bye. So the, the question would be, John, if, if, I had, if I'm making good money, would I have more outgoing ties? Outgoing ties, correct. Yeah, okay. I should have that from the, uh, the, the other stuff I did. Yeah. I mean, you, you could even get a quick and dirty on that by just, you know, looking at house level um, loan density versus average wages. Yeah, right. Yeah, there are, there's some pretty rich houses. Uh, we got a, quite a spread. Right. So, so, John, just real quickly, when I was talking about reciprocity, what I really meant was that under loaning, we didn't see as much reciprocity than we did under friendship. That was the finding. Yeah, 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 sure. Um, fair enough. And the same thing was certainly true for um, uh, the, that the, what we call the confidant relationship of giving and getting advice. But we're actually getting somewhat more evidence of, of um, in the advice network of reciprocity uh, with this bigger sample. Um, if you look at the models that I ran on, um, on the advice giving relationship, the reciprocity parameter is uh, strong and positive. But there, things could be more complicated in a more complicated model because um, I'm still very interested in this. This is a completely different tack, by the way, okay? I'm still very interested in why it is, you know, whether we can figure out whether indeed it is the case that advice seeking in general is a sign of trouble for the individual seeking the advice. Because we know that, that the more advice seeking uh, go, is going on, the more likely a person is to leave the house and to relapse. So that makes sense, right, doesn't it? But the thing is, the question really is, um, is it possible to seek advice and not get it? and therefore not do well, or seek advice and get good advice and do better. John, that's why probably the most interesting thing would be who's asking for advice and who's getting it. And basically yeah. to the extent that you're asking for a lot of advice, but nobody likes you, that's not a good thing. That is a really good thought, Lenny. It's a really good thought. That's a, that's a sad scenario. Well, yeah, but we know there are sad scenarios, scenarios that are going on all the time in these houses. What we're trying to understand is, you know, what's going on under the covers, really, to the extent possible. That, by the way, uh, to, just to repeat, is a di really different tangent than what we were just talking about here with regards to loaning, but equally interesting, maybe more interesting, I don't know. But that's one that we should really have on our to-do list, you know, in big red letters. So yeah. how, is the, how is that advice, how is that worded? Is it, so ego says, I would go to this person for advice? I believe so, yes. You know, it's like, how, how often do you go to so-and-so for advice, isn't that so, right? So this, this is it, seeking advice from another person. Very often or quite often, we basically, very often or quite often, we basically say, okay, that's seeking advice. If you basically say regularly, rarely, or never, we then say it's not seeking advice. Because I, I know that like the loaning, the loaning network and the advice seeking network were competing with each other to predict um, exiting the house and relapse. So there's, there's kind of a connection there and it um, almost like right. John was saying that well, maybe, maybe you're at, no, nobody likes you, so nobody would lend you any money. Yeah. You're asking everybody, you know, God, I could use some help here, but everybody hates me. So that, and you're not going to do well in that house, but I know yeah. people like you. 
and we're willing to loan you money, you might do just fine. There has to be, you know, there has to be some kind of a pattern like that with those people who are asking for advice, doesn't there? There has to be some kind of indicator of disconnect in other areas. And we must have a way of, of, um, um, of sifting that out. I just can't imagine that we don't have the data to figure that out. I, I have to think a little bit about exactly how to, um, kind of what's the best way to like model that. I'm not even sure if we need to do a network model necessarily to do it. Um, Although we would need to use a network data, um, you know, to get an idea, for example, of a person's, you know, I don't know, I just, I don't want to shoot my mouth off here without thinking about it. But I, I think that basic tack, Mike, is, is a really good one. And we just need to think a little bit about how to do it. So John and, and Mike and, and Phil, um, Ted, you know, I just thought maybe it's, this was great speculation and, and idea generation, really wonderful generative thinking. That was yeah. great to have Nate on. But I just want to make sure we have a chance to bring um, kind of Gabby into Oh, the, gosh. Um, oh, Gabby. So we <laughs> kind of lost her for the last hour or so. so but, but she has, and, and, and Mike, if you don't want to stay on the line now, because we'll be talking about Macintosh type stuff. Um, and, and I know you weren't interested because you don't have a Mac. Um, and Phil, because you have one, that's great. John, you can stay on or not, but if you want to stay on, you can certainly help us. Ted, if you can stay on, that'd be great. Um, and Gabby, maybe you could share your screen with us and just tell us the problems you're having so we can see if, see if we can get you hooked up. Well, why don't I stay on just on the odd chance that the problem is actually not Mac related, but something sure. else. Sure, okay. Um, okay. I'll see you guys later. Bye, Mike. Okay. Thanks. Bye, Mike. All right. Um, so I guess it's more of just we finally got everything set up, and it's a little like where to just begin with this and how to get everything actually up and functioning is the stage that I'm at because I have this little like run RCNA model but I didn't know if there was something else that there was. This is just where we left off last time, getting everything in. So just like next steps so that I can actually start trying to like look at code and run some things. Do you want to show us uh, your screen and show us where you're at? Oh, can you not see my screen? Her screen's up. Can you see it, John? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, where are and, you? And and Phil, can you tell us any of the problems that you ran into with Mac that you hmm. can help maybe Gabby with too? Um, yeah, I mean, I Gabby looks much further on <laughs> these models than I've attempted, uh, admittedly. So, um, yeah, that that's about <laughs> all I could say. I mean, she. She has the code and the modeling, it looks like, uh, relatively set up. I'm, so, I'm, I'm so not Gabby, Sure, no, no problem. So Gabby, were there any programs that blew up that basically from Mac you weren't able to use? In other words, did you? Yeah. Show us where you started to have problems, I guess, is the more, the more general question. It's more of just like, I'm not sure where to go from here because I have tried like just running some things and I'll get like a cool little something and I'm like okay I don't know if I did this right though because there's also still that bright red um so unfortunately I don't have like the evidence from that because I kind of sure, sure. thought that I damaged it and was like okay I'm not saving this anyway if it's not right um, well let's let's do this why don't you scroll up to the top of your um script here and let's just uh walk through where you are mm -hmm. um yeah this okay is we did it together and had me just do the little hi there. Okay. So um, have you uh, loaded your packages here in the, in the right now? No, not right now. Go ahead and, and run the that chunk and the load packages chunk. Grinder, 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 grinder. I just want to make sure that the things are working that should be working. And I can explain to you what they do. Yeah, that's all fine. 
Okay, so all it's telling you here is that there are some um, uh, some functions that occur in several different packages, and the one that gets loaded last is the one that um, is assumed to um, uh, th that overwrites the other one basically. So let's suppose that we had two packages that had a read function. The second package that got loaded, that's the read function that would be run unless you specified the other package specifically. So that's all that this is telling you. Scroll down a little further. There's, there, yeah. There's see? a way to, if you don't want all of that information, basically the equivalent of yelling at you and alerting you after you install packages, uh, there's an option uh, that you could put in your R chunk that's just message equals false, and it will suppress all that. I don't know if that would be helpful or not. Um, right. Although sometimes it's useful to get that just in case. Of course, you know, once you've kind of got your packages set up and you know they're loading properly, it's gratuitous to just see this every time. So, yeah. But anyway, that's all that's going on there. And in fact, Gabby, you can actually hit the uh, little... Um, Go up to the top of this output here, and there's going to be a little X right there. This one? You see it? Yeah, just hit that, and that just gets rid of all that crap, so you don't have to be looking at it anymore. Okay, so now we have to load the workspace, um, and that would be the uh, the next chunk, which mm -hmm. says lo under load, so press that. And if you look up in environment there, in a minute, you should start to see all the different objects showing up. Yeah, so click on the environment tab up there. Right now you're looking at the git tab. Okay, hold on. Look at, I look have at, all things open still. <laughs> like, yeah, no, it's okay. Just environment is the, the leftmost tab in the upper right quadrant. There you go. Okay. Yeah. So now you've got all your, all the objects in that workspace are now loaded. Okay. Right? And mm -hmm. those are just objects that, you know, are kind of canonical and, and you know, that you probably should keep around. By the way, John, do we have a subfile for her? maybe a subdirectory that we could have her create if she doesn't have it? Yeah, um, have you created your yourself a, uh, uh, a new branch? The, uh, I know you did. It's this thing, right? Yeah, right, You're, see, yeah. she's in her own branch now. Okay. And so, she, so everything's great. great. She can do anything she wants. What is this error list? Is that anything that I have to be concerned about? That, no, that, that's just basically some, some stuff that was left over from um, when I was originally creating the uh, sort of canonical data sets. Mm -hmm. uh, I had some code that checked the data for each wave and flagged certain kinds of errors. So mm. for example, it would, it would flag a situation where um, um, somebody was in two houses for that wave. And, okay. and we'd have to do something about that. So the error list is nothing more than a list of um, individuals for whom there were errors of one kind or another and it classifies them. But that's of no concern whatsoever. The only objects in here that, that are really gonna be of interest to you will be objects that we'll encounter in the script here going down. Okay. So let's not worry about that for right now. All right, so you've loaded the workspace, that's great. If later on, you want to save it. By the way, I would actually recommend that you create a new workspace called. Um, uh, okay, so you see, you see in the like load and save, the workspace is given a name, the ba and the name is base workspace wksp. Dot w one to seven dot r data. I would. Um, oh, that's not right. Anyway. I would rename both of those to something like um, um, Gabby, G-A-B-B-I, say. Well, dot, that's where you're talking? Yeah, just, no, down here. Yeah, it's gonna be for one to, one to six, actually. Which line are you looking at? Um, that comment there, or the, uh, the code where it says load base workspace for W one to seven. And that should actually say for line, W one to three. Yeah, I like that. Thank you, Len. This one? Okay, I was like... <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, six. Yeah, just put a six there. That, that I should have had that in the original script. And, and do the same there. Yeah. Yeah, and now we're going to rename 
<clears throat> that workspace. And so go up to the load chunk <clears throat> and you see the green code there in line 27 that says base workspace, et cetera. Oh yeah. Change base workspace to just, you know, anything else. It could be just Gabby. Um, okay. Yeah. I'll just do that. That's great. And do the same thing. Um, um, yeah. And, and yeah, take out for all. You see the for all in there? Oh, okay. Yeah, just get rid of that. Oops. That was a six. Okay. Yeah. And then put exactly the same name into the save chunk. Okay. So you could just copy and paste it if you want. Oh, that probably would have been faster. <laughs> it doesn't matter, whatever. Okay. And get get remove the seven from the W one two three four five six etc. in that same line thirty five. See, it says W one two three four five six seven. There we go. All right, and now just uh, save that script. So go up to the little diskette looking thing this at one. the top and click there. And you notice how your um, uh, the title of the script changes from red to black. Okay, so now just go ahead and press um, the uh, run the chunk that for save image. So this one? That one right there. Okay. So what you have now done is you have created a new workspace consisting of stuff that you want to save. You don't have the, the, the same for all one here. And actually, if you wanted to delete, go over here to the lower right quadrant and delete that base workspace for all that our data right there. You could do that. Um, My controls are in the way again. Yeah, no, you don't want to do that. Just say no. Say no. Okay. Okay. Now you want to it's click the, uh, um, the button. Right, yeah, there you go. Okay. To highlight it and go up to uh, the delete right there and press it. Okay. Right. But if you scroll all the way to the bottom of that frame, okay. hey, there, there. there is your workspace. Yeah. So that's the one you're going to be working in from now on. Okay. And I recommend everybody do that because there's going to be a lot of stuff that you will probably create that will be just excuse me, specific interest to you. And if you use the, if you use the other workspace that has the for all in it, mm -hmm. every time you go to push something up to uh, GitHub or pull it back down, there's a possibility it could be overwritten. Okay. All right. And this eliminates that possibility. Actually being in your own branch, it shouldn't really be a problem anyway, but this uh, just removes the possible confusion. Okay. All right. Okay, um, now let's keep going and let's go down to line 43 mm -hmm. and um, go ahead and run that. So any time that I want to do something, I should be going through and running these one by one. No. No. Um, once you've created a data object like this, as long as you want, only want to use the variables that are included in that Sienna data create call, mm -hmm. which would be the advice network, recovery function, recovery factor, I mean, sex, age, in res, um, black ethnicity, and um, of course the comp change vector, or matrix. Um, as long as those are the only variables that you want to do analysis on, you can reuse this data object. Okay. However, let's suppose that you instead wanted to do a, uh, some analysis on um, a friendship network, mm -hmm. okay? Well, you have friendship network, a friendship network available to you, I think, in the global environment here. Like, scroll down and see if you see an FNet. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. FNet 0SD would be the one. So if you put that in instead of advnet 0SD, now your data object will allow you to do analyses on the friendship network. Oh, but you might, you might want to- this is where, this Gabby, is where- Gabby, we're all working on friendship now, so, so that might be an idea because we're not working on advice right now. So if you put, yeah, if you put right. F, capital N, small ET. Yep, she did it. 
you got it. And then, right. on it. And, then and then I would change the name of the data object there to uh, dtobs.fr. DT. No, no, just change oh. it to yeah. You already got the oh. DT op, dot fr. Gotcha. And now you can create a friendship related uh, data object. In fact, um, now you don't have CF in here, and you would have to get the close friend specification from um, uh, from Ted or from me or somebody like that. Um, probably you would want to create that yourself in the uh, RCNA setup script. But you and Ted can interact about how to do that. Okay. Let's leave that aside for now and just run that chunk again. Okay, and this Great. is what you got? Okay. And, and yeah, that's just a warning about some um, uh, having to do with the uh, the way we created the Fnet object, um, but it's fine. Um, okay, so so far so good. Um, now, if you want to get a report of uh, sort of a summary statistics report, you can run that next chunk, which is called get a summary, and it prints something that will be called rfnetmodels.ad.1.text. I so you just want to change the AD because that's yeah. the device. Yeah, change that to just FR. And then do the same thing in the model name spec. Yeah, this part? Correct. Okay. So now you're going to create a um, object that you'll be able to see over in that lower right panel. Um, it's going to be a text file that will contain a bunch of summary information about the um, uh, about the data object, the data in the data object that you just created. So go ahead and run that chunk. Okay. And off she goes, and it takes a minute. Okay. And now you can go take a look at that if you want, just to get a quick idea of what's in there. So this is like summarizing the fact that you have six observations, meaning six waves, 627 actors, you have one network dependent variable, which is the friendship network, okay. right? You have one discrete behavior variable, which is the recovery factor. And then you have four constant actor covariates, which are sex, race, um, time and residence, and um, um, the other one, the I other forget. One. <laughs> <laughs> and one other one. <laughs> okay, forget it. Uh, all right, and we you can go on down there and and see other. Um, this stuff here is just you know giving the degree distribution for all 627 individuals. Um, like you know how many people did they choose as friends? And then you know so basically you have because of the fact that it's a. Uh, uh, you can't have 627 columns going out to the right. It compressed the columns and then it compressed the, uh, the row under the next of those columns. So like that, you know, the first five there corresponds to the first SID. The second five corresponds to the second one. The, the six corresponds to the third guy and so forth. So, so John, if you ever had to figure that out. So John, if we could, I'm going to have to, in about 10 minutes, probably I've got a class that I have to, guest lecture on in California of all things. So maybe all we things. could just go a little bit quicker to get through some of these commands because I think we're doing great. But okay. but just be careful about you gotta just you got A D on there again. Yeah, okay. on there you're talking. So so let's go ahead and, and create an effects object by going to line fifty four and replacing A D with F R. One other place you have to do it, right? Up there in the front. Just in fifty four. I'm 54. Line 54. Oh, right here. Thank yeah. you. Because okay. remember, you created fobs.fr.1, and that's the one that, uh, excuse me, you created a data object for friends. You also are now going to create an effects object for friends. So run that chunk. Okay. Great. It's done. Um, then you can come down here to line 60. Again, replace AD with FR. 
And what this will do, go ahead and run that, okay. is it will create an HTML file that contains all of the effects available to you. And so if you ever want to go check and see, for example, what all of the different characteristics are for a given effect you want to include in a model, you just open up fobshutfr.1.html and look at it. It'll be over here in, there in that lower right panel. Okay, but let's go on now because you know we, we want to get mm -hmm. this done quick. Um, <clears throat> now we're going to create a um, model object and line 66 starts. So go ahead and change the AD to FR there and also to the right. See so under rfnetmodels.ad, let me change that to FR. Change the advnet zero SD spec to fnet zero dot SD, right? And that's a lowercase f, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um, and the, the you can leave the uh, behavior model type the same because that's unchanged. Now go ahead and run that. Okay. And it's telling you that any output that you use <clears throat> that that you get from a model that uses this particular model spec will go into this text file called RFNet models fr text, right? Okay. All right. Now let's scroll down further. We're going to go all the way down to where it says, um, um, and by we'll the get, way, yeah, but you'll change all those ADs to mm -hmm. basically, you know, yeah. friend. So you can, you can do that all at once with just one command. Oh right. yeah. Find, right? Yep. Okay. Find and replace control F. I guess for you on a Mac, it would be um, Command F. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but don't do that now. No. Don't worry oh. about that now. Right. Yeah. Just go ahead and scroll down. Keep going. You're going to go to about line 150 or so. Here we go. Okay. So see where it says look at effects? Mm -hmm. Line. Yeah. Okay. Replace the AD with FR. And now run that chunk. All right, so this shows you the default model that has now been set up for you. And you could run this just the way it is. Um, and it will, it only has an out degree and reciprocity effect for the friendship network. And for the recovery factor, it only has shape parameters, linear and quadratic. Um, but that's a runnable model right there. What you would now have to do to make it a meaningful model is to run various include effects functions, function calls, uh, in the code up above, the code that we just um, slid past. And we don't have time to go through all of that right now, but Ted could help you with that. Notice, okay. Ted, how I'm volunteering you to help. <clears throat> uh, but now let's do one more thing. We'll scroll on down and find, there you go, to the run model command. Okay. Okay, change mod ad.2 in line 156. Yeah, okay, good. And do the same with the data object. You're doing great. You go ahead, keep going. Okay. And do it over there too. Yes. Okay. And that's it. That's all you yeah, okay, you can do that too. Or it does not matter. It's no, that's commented out for the moment, but that's because it's going to be our very first run. Now change mod ad.2, which is the very first thing there, to mod fr.1. Okay. And then run? Um just not one. So you would take it one. On 156. Yeah, see mod fr.2, change that to mod fr.1. It's right where your cursor is. That's it right there. Oh, not one. Okay. Change the, the two to one, yeah. All right, now you can run that okay. if you want. And you can see what happens. And it'll take a while. Okay, did my screen just swap for you guys too to the little nope, image? We can see it. We can see the screen. We're fine. We can see it. Can you see the, um, do you see the little icon with a feather on it? I do not, hold on, let me see. How do I select the screen that I'm currently seeing? So it'll be on the bottom of the screen. This is- There it is, yeah, that's the guy. So okay. that thing there is like a running, um, uh, reference to what's going on. Right now it is doing a little bit of preliminary work, which shouldn't take more than a few seconds. Um, 
and then you will start to see um, some numbers show up in the current parameter values and the deviation values while it does phase one. Phase one just basically involves calculating some, some numbers to help the algorithm figure out what direction to go to make the parameter vector fit the data better, okay? okay. And so that's what you'll start to see if all goes well. Um, if all does not go well, then it will blow up with some kind of an error message. Oh, jeez. Okay, so with yeah, that... that... So that's it. That's oh. what you have to do to run a model. All right. That sounds good then. Um, thank you so much for the help. I just needed like that extra push to show. Of course, of course. No problem. So Lenny, uh, you're good? Fantastic. Good. Thank you for going over this. It, this okay. it sounds like... Uh, um, I wasn't sure we were going to get into all this, but this is great to go through okay. a step, step. So it's all taped. Anyone wants to look at it, they can see it in the future. And that's, uh, that's wonderful. Um, and I hope this was helpful to you, Phil, too. Um, sounds like good. All right. Well, I'll, I'll put this up on, on YouTube so you can all come back to this if you want to and uh, review it. Yeah. So, yeah, this was uh, very helpful. And... Uh, we went through a lot of stuff, but this was great. Um, can, can I say one more thing before we go? Sure. And that is that I think at this point it would really benefit everybody, if they haven't done so already, to uh, go and read the uh, social networks paper by Snyder's Van de Bund and Stengler, Stengler which defies, defi but yeah, describes the whole modeling procedure. Because now you actually know enough about it so that what they're describing there will have some points of reference. It's a fairly technical article, but not so technical that you have to like be a real mathematician to know it. In fact, Phil, you might find it a little bit sketchy. Um, but there is, you know, if you want all the math, I can I can give you references to uh, papers with everything in it. I just uh, attached it in the chat here for sweet for those who don't have it. So I had I had it on my machine. It's been well done. I've occasionally looked at. Um, it's it's a lengthy, I mean, it's and dense. Lengthy, dense paper. I think it's like a good 48, 50 pages if you count all the references and appendix. No, it's not that long, but it's 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 still <clears throat> there's a lot in there. Um, but believe me, it's worth the pain to go through and try to figure it out. Um, this is such an unfamiliar modeling method for most of us, and an unfamiliar way of thinking about data. Um, that the sooner you get into the weeds, the better. Eventually, the weeds will start to make sense. Trust me. And, and by the way, that's all. Just, just also just having these discussions and thinking about the model building and what we're learning. I mean, this is also um, incredibly helpful to you know help us sort of think about how we think in these terms um, yeah. and really endogenous terms. You know, where we're seeing effects of things that usually we can't kind of put together because they're usually just unitary. So this yeah. is what's fun about this. Great guys. Thank you all. Yes. Good to see you. As always, questions, let me know. Fantastic. Thank you all. Thanks, Bye, everybody. Bye.